Hello, and welcome to episode 16 of What Sex Got to Do With It. And I'm here with my favorite 84 year old <laughs> great grandmother. But first, I have to tell you something. You know, the, 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 I've gotten some information I mean, from our local cluster galaxies that include Andromeda that there is another uh, author, oh, great grandmother. Oh dear. Yeah, and initially we thought that uh, uh, she was older than 84 year old, 84. But the, the the revolution of that planet around the sun, <laughs> it didn't, you know, it, it made it seem that, that she was older, but when you control me for the, our son, actually she's younger than me, so oh, it still holds. Oh, good, <laughs> yeah. I'm glad, yeah. So, 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 mm -hmm. so, so this chapter is called, It's a Bountiful World. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually this chapter came from a colleague, one of my George's colleagues, yeah. who was visiting from the West, and. We had lunch together at Jimmy's and, you know, I expressed my despair over the climate and when given his wife for walking me back to my condo just across the street, he said, Heather, Heather, don't despair. You have to remember it's a bountiful world. Oh. It's a bountiful world. In fact, I credit him in the acknowledges, okay. acknowledgments for reminding me that it's a bountiful world. He said, there's plenty for all of us, all species, humans, there's plenty for everyone. We just have to correct the flaws in the distributive function of human economic systems. So, so he just said, remember, it's a bountiful world. Right. And I thought the last chapter, you know, we were a little wonky talking about that. I have to save myself sometimes from despair because I can worry about the climate and inequality and injustice by taking a walk in the woods. And I'm just always reminded that it's a bountiful world. And my own life is a bountiful life. I feel I've often, uh, not often, but I recently told some, if you put something on my tombstone, just put love's been good to me. Because I've been lucky in, in having such warm relationships with so many people. And I'm very, very lucky. I feel the natural world return the love that I feel for it. Okay. So that is, that, you know, that is what the Bountiful World title comes from, but it's directly in response to Gibbs saying, Heather, Heather, don't get down. Remember, it's a Bountiful World. I'm glad, you know, and, and, and I don't recall you mentioning him when we, you know, did the acknowledgments, mm -hmm. because we did the acknowledgments first, yeah. and, uh, and that's why we're on chapter 15 now, even though this mm -hmm. is episode number 16. I mean, so, so when you talk about this, you open it up and you talk about I mean, the nature of, of the species. I mean, that it's a wonderful species that can create places like mm. New York City, I mean, which I love, you know, uh, um, and, but more so like all the variety that's there. Oh. I mean, uh, but yet it has all uh, these inequities, I mean, and, and I'm kind of curious, I mean, I mean, do you think that it's kind of the natural process that those two would kind of go hand in hand, that it would take I me mean, a certain uh, degree of, of inequality? Because I mean, and, and, and I'm getting at inequality as opposed to inequity, because I, I, cause I, I think that we aren't necessarily going for I mean, there being poverty. I mean, mm -hmm. um, um, let me rephrase that. Of course we're not going for poverty. I think we're not going for that everyone has to have the same amount. No. We just want to make sure that I mean, everyone has enough to thrive. Mm -hmm. I mean, so do you think that it requires a society in which you do have I mean, a certain level of inequality, but still equity, I mean, or still people to pr pr produce a place like New York? Well, I don't, Henry George's book, again, yeah. Progress and Poverty, he puzzled over how come the more material progress we make, and he quoted the big cities, the poverty in those cities is more extreme. As we create more wealth, the inequality becomes more extreme. I don't think we need, I don't think we need the kind of inequality that makes it difficult for some people to live. I think we're a hierarchical species, as one of the wonderful things that I love about us as a species and the individuals within a species, we all have different talents and abilities, different motivations. Some people aspire 
to own more things, to have more things, to work harder. Other people want leisure time to dream, to think, to paint, to write. So we're driven, we're different. We're, we, have diff we bring different skill sets. So I don't think that you need to have inequality in order to have achievement. Achievement happens. We're, again, we're so good at sharing skills. That's the upside of our language ability. I think I mentioned somewhere in the book, not in this chapter, but any other species, if you took the skills of each individual and combined it into one right. super animal, it wouldn't be much different than the individuals. Humans, not so. You combine all our skills, essentially, in if you look at the entire species, all the individuals, the super species that look at what we can do. I, I marvel. I wouldn't know how to manufacture a lead pencil, and yet people are building uh, or, or working on nuclear fusion. I, I, I read uh, about that and I think, wow, the things that our combined talents can produce. But I don't think that any, it's necessary to have achieve, to have inequality in order to have achievement to, because people are driven by different things. Some people want to write symphonies, some people want to build skyscrapers. And that's the thing I, you know, I too often say, oh, we're not a pretty species. But in that sense, in, in the extent of all the wonderful things we can produce, we are a pretty species. But what's not pretty about us is when, you know, when, well, when greed, right. when greed and tribalism, greed and tribalism are two really human species specific traits that we have to learn to rise above. And I think we are. I think individuals do it all the time. But I, I think, you know, if we really want to have a sustainable and a just world, we have to we have to really watch that we're not just indulging greed. When we were talking again, I was in a science discussion about uh, creating nuclear fusion, which that's not my field at all. I think, wow, wow, amazing that people know how to do this. And some of the people in the group actually worked, actually have worked in the field. But at one point they say, well, it's great because we have a combination of um, public and private investment in, in building the sun. Of course, my reaction is, hello, there is already a sun up there. Isn't it a bit hubris to think that we need to build one here just so humans have this endless supply of energy so we can have all this excess of stuff that doesn't make sense to me but one of them was talking about well you know this is good the fusion of public and private uh, investment in the creation of a nuclear fusion as an energy source and then they named some of the big investors you know some of the big tech guys and I said ooh. I don't want those guys being in charge of my future because they're very profit driven. You know, they are, I mean, they're also driven to discover and develop, but the profit motive is pretty strong there. And so whenever the development, the drive, a driving force behind the development is to earn a big profit, I, I'm, I, I become uneasy. Uh, but I guess one of the good things about fusion though is would it would stop. Um, decrease our need to use fossil fuels. Um, yeah, yeah, and make people keep saying when it's going to happen. Yeah. And the reply has been pretty standard for decades. Oh, maybe in the next 30 years. That's yeah. the same time frame that yeah. they quote. Right. So I, I uh, rather than trying to create another sun, I think it would be better to educate people to control some of their um, consumption. That's that you know. I I think that's that's a more reasonable yeah. uh, way to get there in less than thirty years. Right, right, right. You know, so um, in talking, there's a sentence early on in this chapter I mean, where you say that an economy that grants personhood to corporations but denies it to the more than human beings, this is a win the go economy. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions. You know. So what do you mean by a more than human being? I, I don't remember when I wrote that okay, and right. at what point yeah. that fit. Yeah. Read it again to me. Sure, yeah. and, and you're talking about Marshall Salins, okay. you know, and, and mm -hmm. that 
I mean, you know, the market system automatic, artificially creates scarcity by blocking the flow between the source and the consumer. Mm -hmm. And then you end by saying an economy that grants personhood to corporations but denies it to the more than human beings. Okay. Yeah. And I, again, I'm thinking of Citizens United where yeah. we're saying that corporations are people. Okay. And, and yet those who are deprived, right. the very things they need to right. live, right. how can we say that corporations are humans and yet we consider some people almost less than humans. Got you. So, that's so, you so that, Got that, you. that is my meaning yeah, on that okay. one. I, I, and I'm quoting, yeah. you know, Robin Wall Kimmerer, the, uh, who wrote Braiding Sweetgrass, and anyone who has not read that book should really read that book. Huh? Uh, I've been very moved by her writing yeah. and, uh, and her sense that a sharing economy right. and uh, sort of the kinds of reciprocity where when one of us thrives, we all thrive. Right. Um, that's it. And also living in balance with the natural world. She's right. very, very, very um, instructive. She's, a, a, I think her PhD is in, you know, trained botanist. She's, mm -hmm. a, I think her PhD is in botany, but she's also a member of one of the, the native uh, indigenous groups. Right. And so she brings the two ways of knowing, right. both that kind of indigenous hunter-gatherer respect the environment way of knowing with a deep understanding of the science of plants and nature and, right. and so she braiding sweetgrass is just a really lovely book it's a series braiding, of sweet, sweet. Bra braiding sweetgrass yeah. and it's funny it was published by a small publisher yeah. oh maybe six or seven years ago didn't get much of a fuss just by word of mouth right. it's now consistently on the on the bestseller list just by word of mouth. So I think people are hungry yeah. for that kind of knowledge, the sense that it is a bountiful world, and we just have to treat it with respect, and there will be plenty for everyone. It, there, there's enough bounty for all. Right. So can you explain the Wendigo economy? That's her expression, right. and that's, that's like a, a mythical figure uh -huh. that just consumes greedily everything. Yeah. Just ravishes the world and it's it's uh, it, you know so in in her culture that's a mythical uh, figure and and I look at what we're doing right now and think and I think she may even say it's a Wendigo economy I think that where gotcha. we're where we just consuming without returning right. and just ravaging the natural world without giving back to it you know just like in some of her essays she talks about you thank the plant that you're harvesting twigs from. You express gratitude. You, you, you take care of it. You recognize you don't cut everything down. You know you need it in the future. And, and, and that, way, that way of viewing the world, I find, um, as I say, other people must too because it's now consistently high on the bestseller list. I think it's, it was published as a paperback, so it's on the paperback bestseller list. But right. it, consistently is and it makes me happy every time I see it there right so so um so in this chapter you talk about me the crow that oh, Joe, the you, crow. Joe, Joe uh, and you talk about this photo that the that exists that I guess your granddaughter had or my daughter, daughter my had. I'm I, ing I you know I, yeah. I that's pre-pandemic yeah. I was always hopping on the 77 bus and going to a lecture somewhere Harvard Radcliffe right. MIT um, and this was at the Radcliffe Institute. Someone was talking about New Caledonian crows and their tool use. And my daughter Ingrid said, I'll go with you, Mom. And so the two of us went. And we got in there. Here she pulled out a photograph that she'd had, a 70-year-old photograph of me. I guess it was the first day Joe the Crow entered our lives. And the story of Joe the Crow my parents never had much money, but they always liked nice real estate. So they always rented properties that they never could afford to, to buy. They rented a, a sort of rundown, but once elegant 10 acre property in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And my father was out one morning. Oh, he just despaired of his three daughters who were all late sleepers. And he would get up at dawn and he was out, wedged himself into a wild bramble of blackberry bushes and was picking blackberries into his hand and then eating them. And while he was doing that, suddenly a crow 
just dropped from the sky and landed on his forearm and started eating the blackberries that were in his palm. So Daddy walked back to the house, balancing that crow with, the crow just balanced there like it was a falcon on his arm. And he woke us up to come down. The crow had obviously been hand raised by someone we never knew who, but we played with him. We had a stone patio in the back of the house and my two sisters and I would bring things out to entertain him. We were blown away by his skill, his intelligence, his tool use. Uh, uh, I say he invented either a musical instrument or a, uh, or a toy, whatever. And he was a thief, he was a scoundrel. And the whole, he, he once, my father had brought him home and the three of us had played with him. We much debated, are we gonna keep him? because oh, we wanted him. He was so magical. He was just so lovely. A bunch of old cages in the barn we could have put him into. But we, we, he seemed like he was making a gift of himself to us and it wouldn't be right to keep him. In addition, the whole time he was with us, the wild crows are circling above, calling him, warning and telling him, danger, danger. And we didn't want to prove them right either. So he would play with us for half an hour, an hour. Took my father's lens clap, cap from his camera, flew up, hid it in a knot hole in the walnut tree in the yard. Oh, anything shiny, up it went. He would take it. But he could give him a little hard rubber ball. He could bounce it across the patio. My sister Gail brought out one of those old-fashioned pencil sharpeners like used to be fastened to the teacher's desk. She put it on the patio, showed Joe how it worked. With his beak, he put a pencil in it, stood on one leg, and with the other leg tried to turn the handle. Was never able to sh actually sharpen the pencil. He didn't have that kind of strength. So we gave him stuff with moving parts that entertained him. And in I mention in the book, in hindsight, with my fascination with the evolution of language, I look back on what I think was the most amazing thing that Joe ever did, because when I was in undergraduate school, I had a psychology professor tell me that unless you can't hold something in mind unless you have language to name it. So I would kind of always believed that. So we gave Joe an empty good and plenty box, the old fashioned, you know, with the flaps at either end. There was a driveway in front of our house that had gravel in it. When he's on the patio, he can't see that gravel, yet somehow he held in mind that that gravel was out there. That, in hindsight, amazes me. He picked that empty good and plenty box up, flew low to the ground around the house. Obviously, he wanted the three of us to follow him. When he got to the driveway, he closed one flap, picked up, put a half dozen pebbles or so into the good and plenty box, closed the lid on it, picked it up, and shook it like a rattle or a music. I, he was just amazing. So for several weeks, every morning he would come. There, the porch roof was right outside my bedroom window. And at daybreak, oh, my father loved that crow. He got us all up at daybreak. He would come at daybreak, land on the porch roof, and peck, peck, peck on my window, bedroom window. How he even knew that that was where to peck, I have no idea. But we'd get up and run outside and play with him. And then... And then, yes, read the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're we're going to end up in tears if we talk about that. Yeah, so, I so, will. I'll yeah. cry right now. Yes, yeah, it's true. So, so, so no, definitely read the book, you know. Uh, but in, it, it gets a little rough, but then, you know, there's, a, there's you know, we, we, we pull through the rough part. And, uh, 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 but you see there's a picture Yes. Your daughter has a picture. Is that picture still available? Oh yeah. And so, so I'm I'm not going to promise anything, you know. But but just maybe we'll be able to edit it in if you can um, get it to ACM. Oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, if if not, if it's oh, not possible. I I have it. I yeah. actually have a copy of it. Yeah. I'm I'm crouched behind him like yeah, this, yeah, <laughs> yeah. just like I cannot yeah. believe the miracle of yeah. that crow. Yeah, because the picture's not in the book. No, no. So then, no, if the picture's no. in this series, it will be like. Yeah, the, no. Makes and it my older sister, yeah. Sandy, who was three years older, she's watching a little more <laughs> relaxed yeah. about the whole thing. Yeah. I was just overcome with the miracle of that yeah. crow. Yeah. I, uh, that crow, yeah. I still, with that crow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, even you, as your daughter, I think, said, or maybe your granddaughter says, you're the, the girl that cries, cries wow. wow. I'm and, the girl uh, that so, cries so, wow. So, yep. So even, even <laughs> since then. So. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, the, 
I'm going to, right now, I'm going to do a little kind of um, housekeeping, you know, before we maybe come back to the last chapter uh, to discuss, you know, um, Alaska's system and, and oh. you know, politics and money. Yeah, but yeah, I, I mean, two episodes ago, I mentioned Jennifer Lerner you know, in the context of um, decision making and the angry mind. So I just wanted to say to the folks that that is the, the name of the paper is, is Portrait of an Angry Decision Maker. But we were talking about how you know, strong emotions, especially anger, I mean, can lead people to feel a sense of certainty, you know, mm -hmm. especially about being the victim. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that sense of certainty kind of stops the thinking process. You know. mm -hmm. I'm not saying necessarily a conclusion is wrong, but that you stop thinking I mean, so so it probably inhibits the ability to come to better conclusions, mm -hmm. even if your conclusions right. And um, the other thing I'd mentioned was from an early chapter where you talked about um, generosity and a loose collection of traits that you that you say you quote to quote you says that I code as control of social resources rank high on the list of characteristics that add luster to a man's sexual aura. Yep. So, so um, what's that loose constellation of traits? Well, you know, I've talked so much about control of material resources yeah. because that's where the environmental damage comes from. But there were other traits that were equally, made a man equally attractive, if not even more so. And things like generosity, I'm good with my kids, uh, uh, admired by his friends, you know, so that's so control of social resources. And I think in mentioning those, where I was going with that was that much as I've talked about this, this kind of greed more, 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 there's also, we have these other kind, generous, giving, wonderful traits that women have selected men for and that are in us. They're part of our species. And those are the traits we have to draw on if we're going to solve some of our problems. And, and I, but control of social resources right. gives a man great aura. You know, you would, you'd talked to me a few sessions ago about, I think, positive and negative leadership. Yeah, I, power. Power, power. Yeah. power. Yeah. Um, and that's a positive power. Right. Like the control of social resources right. where you've got friends that will do anything for you and that you'll do anything for. Right. And, and that he's a positive right. leader. He's he's a leader right. by virtue of people want to follow him, and, and you know. So those are the traits we have. Those right. really wonderful traits, gotcha. and they've all they're part of our species specific um, arsenal, and and we're going to need those to solve the, some of the problems right. brought about by our greed and by our tribalism. Right. Uh, you know, tribalism we have to rise above to. Right. So. So yeah, so we ended the last episode in uh, talking about um, money and politics, and we said we'd pick it up here. And so I want to go back to it a little bit. And, and so a, a question I have is, do you think it's possible a, for a politician to accept a lot of money and not be corrupted? I guess it's and I don't. I don't mean like a low frequency. Do I mean it's like? Do you think that it? Do you th because I mean a lot of politicians accept money. Yeah. I mean, so are you saying that? They're all on some level, I mean, um, the word isn't corrupt. I think mm. overly influenced me by Overly the, influenced you by know, it. Do you think it's, it's the case? It's hard not to because of the re reciprocity we're talking about. If someone gives you a gift, you know, that's an imbalance of reciprocity. So you want to do something back. You and I were talking about that yeah. earlier. And so a, a donation of a large amount of money you, you, there's now an imbalance in reciprocity. And so you, there is sort of a need to want to do something for that person. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, because reciprocity is important to us, I think that does make it very, di very, very difficult to ignore right. the influence of a large donation of money. Right, right. I, I, I mean, I, th I, I don't think most people would acknowledge that they've been influenced, right. but they'll think, well, you know, he really has a good idea on right. that. Right. I should pay attention to that idea. That's how our brain is so tricky, right. you know. Right. Well, it was, would also mean, so I hear you there, Ian, and I think one of the things that could work too to help um, people not 
focus so much on their next election, I mean, which is often, I think, the, 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 the influence of, of the money, because I mean, you mm -hmm. generally need the money for, for mm -hmm. your, your campaign, I mean, and then mm -hmm. for, for your next one, is, is if we gave people electeds, I mean, uh, easy off-ramp, I mean, so that, so that, I mean, because we, at a certain level, they're earning a salary, so mm -hmm. their position is their livelihood, I mean, and so it's kind of hard to, to give up your source mm -hmm. of income, I mean, um, clearly, I mean, people become attached to it because it becomes part of the identity, but also it's like their livelihood, so that if we just said, well, you know what, I mean, in your first year out, I mean, you get like a certain percentage of your salary, I mean, enough to mm -hmm. certainly live on, I mean, because cause I'll tell you, here in Arlington, I mean, the select board gets just a stipend of 250 mm -hmm. yeah. a month, I mean, and on some levels, you, you would think, well, it's nice, it'd be nice to make more, but the fact that the, your income isn't coming from that it means that it's really easy to say, you know what, I mean, I'm just going to make the best decision that I can mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if I don't get elected, again, it's not like I'm losing my income. Yeah, right, um, and, right. And, and so, so as hard as it may be to essentially have two jobs, it does make it easier mm -hmm. mean, to make the decisions. I mean, if, for me, it wouldn't be, so now it's like a person could give me as much as they want it for the campaign, but I'm not. I don't, I'm not feeling that that tug. In fact, if anything, I find that I have to be careful about not overcompensating mm -hmm. um, for it, and and that does a disservice too, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to to the person and the cause behind them. So I'm totally on board with getting the the money out of politics. I mean, yeah. but then us as said, I mean, making it easy for the person, you know, to exit. And, and I'm know. actually in faith. I mean, our federal. Uh, politicians, you know, th they retire quite nicely, I yeah. believe, after they've yeah. spent so many years in yeah. office. And I'm in favor of paying them a wage commensurate with what they would earn in the private sector. Right. So that there is not this temptation to accumulate money and power. And I'm really putting those two together because right. very often they are together, right. just like youth and beauty are often together. Um, in the eyes of the beholder. Yes, that's yeah. definitely true. <laughs> yeah, De uh, definitely uh, true. You know, because uh, mm -hmm. um, I think some people are attracted to older people. You know, so so. Uh, I, I uh, think some of that may be influenced by the person's gender, but I could be wrong on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know. Um, yeah. Oh, men tend to be attracted. General again, no. that biology is not destiny; it's statistical probability. But in general, men tend to be attracted to younger women, and very often women are attracted to older men. Not so much because they like them all, but uh, they've accumulated more wealth at that point. Yeah. You know, but yeah. that's again that that's a stereotype that I you can't assume that that's true for everybody because it's definitely yeah. not. But I mean, and, and right, but we're talking pro the. Averages, I mean, yeah, um, the which probability, is what, yeah, yeah, which is all, I mean, the basic yeah. population evolution. Yeah. So, so with that, <laughs> we, we end, I mean, and then we get ready for our final episode. Uh, so, thank you. Thank, thanks, Len.